name is Rocky Montgomery, and I'm here visiting the archives of falconry, the amazing archives. And I just want to share some of the interesting things, some of the things that I find particularly interesting that you can find here at the archives. One of the first things that people ask you when you tell them you're a falconer is they say, do the birds always come back? And your response is usually, most of the time, but not always. And one of the things that uh, falconers always have to contend with is trying to find their lost bird. And that has been true throughout time. And one of the first ways that falconers used to get their birds back is with something called a barbel. And we have a couple of examples here. And basically what they are are early name tags. They're little rings that would be attached to the falcon's jesses and they would be inscribed, and they were used to attach the leash to, but once the birds were flying, if they were lost, then that would tell whoever recovered the bird who the bird belonged to. And we have a few examples here at the archives, and here's one right here on the back of this hood that was uh, owned by a famous British falconer, Gage Freeman. Also, falconers have always attached bells to their birds to keep track of them and find them when they can't see them. And these are probably the earliest way that falconers had to find their hawks. Just by the sound of the bell, they would follow them and find them. And normally, they would have two bells on the bird, and each bell would be slightly toned differently so that the sound would carry a little better. This is an American example from the late 20th century made by Pete Asborno, and he made beautiful bells, and he developed what was called the acorn bell, and you can see it's two different types of metals inserted together, and they make semitone differences. And that's what you would follow and find your hawk. Now, this was the technology for many, many years, thousands of years, but it didn't always mean you got your bird back. It was still pretty hard to find a bird that had wandered off many, many miles away, as falcons can do. But through technology and modern science, we ended up with something called telemetry. And this happened in the late 60s. During the early 60s, you had a lot of um, wildlife biologists using telemetry, radio telemetry on large mammals and tracking them. Uh, the Craigheads were famous for putting telemetry on grizzly bears in Yellowstone. And we have some early examples of radio telemetry here at the archives. And one of the earliest examples is right here. This is the <coughs> Drake SPR-4. And this would be put on, your, on a backpack, on your back, with a motorcycle battery to power it. And you'd lug this along on, a, on one of those big backpacks, and you'd use this um, antenna here, Yagi antenna, to uh, track your bird down. And it would probably be wearing a, a transmitter like this. This would not probably not work for your Merlin, but uh, might be OK for your red tail. Uh, but uh, that was a little, little bit awkward. Uh, not quite as practical for everyday use and a little uh, expensive for the average falconer and lugging around a, a motorcycle battery might not have been the easiest thing in the world. So some people decided that they would try to miniaturize it and in the late 60s Robert Berry saw that there was a possibility so he contacted uh, William Cochran, 
Cochran and Barry started working on trying to make it a little bit more practical and a little smaller. They came up with a smaller version and in 1969, Bob Barry put a transmitter on a jerkin February 11th and that was the first Falcon retransmitter put on a bird. And in 1971, the evolution of the transmit of the telemetry progressed to the point where Tony Zelpo came out with the RB4, the Falconer. And this was the first compact, affordable falconry specific receiver available to the falconry community. And some of you might wonder, where did the RB come from? And that stands for Robert Berry. So this is the classic that we all started out with in the late 70s, early 80s, and made an incredible change in falconry. Because now we weren't afraid to lose our birds because we knew we could track them down. So we started flying birds heavier. We started taking more risk with the birds in different flights and we started to increase their their condition and experimenting with different flights that weren't possible just with bells and it opened up an entire change in in the way we saw uh, the potential for flights grouse in in the western united states were now possible because you could track your bird down over two or three, four or five miles. You could take chances where you would fly your bird at a certain weight or in certain wind conditions and now you got more out of your birds and they, they approached more, the flights became more like wild bird flights and that's what we're, our goal is always to get that ultimate, the best flight. And this opened that up. The telemetry allowed us to do that. In the back of your mind, you're always a little bit afraid, you know, no, nah, I better not fly the bird because, you know, I might lose it. Well, now this gave you more confidence and you were able to get better flights. But even though it was compact, you still had to lug around a pretty good size antenna and you had two pieces like this and you, you were, had your antenna in one hand and your receiver in the other hand and a lot of times you had your headphones on and you were trying to track your bird and you're trying to walk across the fields. Even though these were quite a bit more, more compact, they were still quite, quite a chore to, to haul around. And we started to get more and more compact. And pretty soon the receiver was attached to the antenna. And that made it even easier because now it was just a single unit and it would start out a larger antenna with a small receiver attached to it. And as it progressed through the evolution of the technology, just like everything else, it got smaller and, and better. And now we have a receiver and antenna like this, which runs on UHF, ultra high frequency uh, transmitters. And originally, like with the RB4, we were using VHF, which was um, very high frequency. And it would start it out at 151 megahertz, went to 216 megahertz, 218, 220. And ultimately we've gone now to uh, UHF where we're at 433 megahertz, 434 megahertz. As the transmitters, as the, the frequencies got, got higher, the transmitters got smaller, the antennas. This is a 216 transmitter right here. Um, you can see the antenna is, is probably about a foot long. As the uh, frequencies got higher, the antennas got shorter. This is a UHF antenna. You can see it's, it's about seven, seven inches long. Uh, it became more powerful. 
uh, gave falconers more confidence in finding their birds and the flights became more and more outstanding flights. You, you could take chances and um, push the envelope and get even, even more from your birds. You could raise their weight because you had more confidence in retrieving your bird. And that was what, what it's all about. And as that progressed, we went to the next step. That is GPS. And in this system, not only can we find our birds, we can watch the birds while they fly. We can watch them on our smartphone and see exactly where they are because they're using GPS technology. And this even allows more freedom and more choices and more confidence in a falconer, in, in the falconer's birds and the flights that he can he or she can uh, obtain.